I wanted to take a quick look at comparative genomics. So the first thing to think about is genome size. So the human genome, 3 billion bases, but 25,000 genes. Mouse, 2.6 billion bases, 25,000 genes. Arabidopsis thaliana, which is mouse at crest, 100 million uh, in genome size and 25,000 genes. So what you're seeing here is that you can have a dramatic change in genome size when you're not really changing the number of genes within the particular organism very much. Uh, if you look at nematode worms, they have 19,000 genes, so you've only got a change of about 6,000. What humans, mice and Arabidopsis have in common is their higher level eukaryotes. So they have multiple tissue types and they have a complex life uh, structure. So they have, particularly in plants, you have different responses to different environmental conditions. In mice and humans, you have uh, complicated biochemistry and uh, immunology. So they have characteristic sets of genes which are specific to those lineages. And they're much more complicated than the simplest eukaryotes, which is yeast, which has about 6,000. Viruses have very, very small numbers of genes and very small uh, genome sizes. This is because they are purely parasitic and they lack most of the things requiring them to actually be functional. So 90% of human protein domains are present in fruit fly and worm. So that means there are lots of core functions which are present in all the eukaryotes. So some of these are to do with how you place cells within the organism, where they're located. Some of them are to do with uh, the general metabolism and catabolism, which have to be present in all organisms, but they'll also be present in lower organisms, including yeast. But multicellular, multi-tissue organisms are going to have quite a lot of genes dedicated to those particular properties. 61% of fruit fry proteins, 43% of worm proteins, and 46% of yeast proteins are similar. It's slightly odd that the worm proteins are a bit lower, but this suggests that a side uh, divergence, uh, well, it was that they have different needs to the higher eukaryotes. But if you're thinking about it, because the yeast has such a smaller uh, number of genes, this is not completely unexpected. It's a bit of a, a statistical anomaly. So the first microbial genome was Haemophilus influenzae, uh, found in 1995 by Tigger, the, uh, which was an institute founded by Craig Venter. An interesting thing about Haemophilus influenzae, it has that name because they originally thought that it was the cause of influenza. It's actually... Uh, Hib, so it actually causes meningitis. So it causes the secondary infections you get when you've got influenza or something like COVID when the bacteria come in afterwards, but it's not the cause of influenza. And I've seen people saying that even in a textbook, which is kind of worrying. So, what sort of useful things can we do with um, genomes? <coughs> well, something interesting that we'd like to know about is lots of people died of the Black Death, which happened between 1347 and 1351. About 30 to 50% of the European population died. It completely changed the social structure of uh, European countries. This is bubonic. Uh, we want to know whether that Black Death was actually bubonic plague. So is it the result of Yersinia pestis infection? So what you need to do is go and get some samples from the burial plots of uh, plague pits. There are lots around uh, in Exeter. A hotel was built on, the hotel car park was built on one of the plague pits. And most large cities had them where they just had mass graves for plague victims. So what they did was uh, looked at these and they got sort of inconclusive results contradictory results because you have a problem of mixing of genomes and mixing of different things but when they actually looked at uh, 
DNA and teeth of the victims and contemporary Yersinia pestis, then they finally managed to prove that there is a link. So the Black Death was bubonic plague. Other important genomes that we've uh, sequenced yeast is very important. It's one of the smallest uh, eukaryotes. There's two types of it. Saccharomyces cerevisiae and Cystosaccharomyces pombi. Pombi, which is fish in yeast, is the model organism for understanding cell divisions. It, uh, between the two yeasts, there is a gene duplication events. So what you've had is a large part of the genome have been copied uh, into between one yeast and the other, which means one has a much larger genome, but effectively they have very similar number of genes. Uh, the nematode worm, C. elegans, was uh, used so that you could look at multicellular organisms and you could understand the development from the embryo to the adult organism. So how you get the process of uh, formation of the original uh, set of cells and how you uh, form the gastrointestinal tract, which is actually an external uh, sort of loop. So if you think about your digestive tract, it's not actually inside, well, it's inside your body kind of physically, but it forms an external um, surface, another surface like your skin. So that whole process of gastrulation is very important to understand in um, the development of organisms. Uh, Drosophila melanogaster, the fruit fly, has been studied for a long time because of mutation studies. Uh, they were very easy to mutate organism. And then there's Arabidopsis thaliana, which is the basic plant uh, genome. We now have uh, many other plant genomes, such as rice and wheat, which allow us to look at uh, what is happening in crop species. And particularly there, they've got lots of genome duplications. Uh, so they're, instead of being, we're a diploid organism, two copies of each one of the chromosomes, they can have much higher copy number. Uh, this is important, so it can be hexaploid or something like that, because it explains how different ancestral uh, grasses combine together to create our food crops. And it also explains why they have such large seeds, which is an important thing, because that's what we grind to make our bread. And that's what we use as our crop. One thing you can do when you're comparing uh, different organisms is you can line up the chromosomes and you can compare them to each other. So this is a process called uh, syntony. So what you can do is you can colour the sections uh, from the different chromosomes in humans and you can lay them on the uh, different chromosomes for mice. So in fact, this one's done the other way around. You've got the colouring on the human chromosomes is related to the colouring of the mouse chromosomes. So if you look at the X and Y, the X chromosome of humans corresponds to the X chromosome of mice and the Y chromosome of humans is much larger, but quite similar to the Y chromosome of mice. Those two things have in common. But if you look at chromosome one of humans, that's made up of sections from chromosome four, from chromosome 3, a very small bit from chromosome 5, and uh, as well as material from chromosome 1 in mice. So what you're seeing, and this is why species develop, is you move large parts of uh, the genome between different chromosomes. This makes it impossible for more distantly related organisms to mate with and produce reproductive offspring with these uh, variants as you change the chromosome structure and order because you can't get the crossover therefore you can't actually reproduce. This is why if you cross a donkey with a horse you get a sterile mule because of these chromosome shifts. So we cannot, you can't do a human mouse cross because of these chromosome rearrangements and the different number of chromosomes in general. Chimpanzees uh, have the, our, our closest relative in terms of uh, genome variations and uh, their sequence was completed in 2003 and they've got signs of adaptive uh, 
evolution in smell, digestion, bone growth, hairiness and hearing. Uh, so these are things that are quite obviously different uh, between ape species. They, the sense of smell and which chemicals and odours we respond to are very different depending on pheromones and what we're attracted to in terms of food and what we're repulsed by in terms of waste. Uh, Digestion is a bit harder to understand. Hairiness is quite obvious too. Uh, large parts of it will be compared 99% are identical and 29% of protein sequences are identical. Uh, the usual rate of change is one amino acid change in 6 million years and we have uh, not a huge amount of diff um, separation from the rest of the great apes. So they're 60 times less change than between human and mice and 10 times less between uh, the change between mouse and rat, which are much closer to each other. So you can look at these um, changes and you can begin to construct a phylogenetic tree and infer when the different populations and different species diverge from each other. The biggest changes are in the conserved non-coding regions. Uh, so this is where you get large amounts of uh, sign and line repeat. And these are the things we use for DNA fingerprinting. So it's not particularly surprising that these non-coding regions, so things that don't produce proteins, uh, but are involved in some way in kind of regulation, are evolving faster. If you want to read the references, then you can find it here. Another interesting genome uh, which has been quite helpful to us is the platypus genome because they're egg laying mammals and it's always been very difficult to figure out where they fit in the tree of life. So they have 18,500 protein coding genes and 80% similar to mammalians. But because they lay eggs you want to figure out whether you, where you place them between mammals and reptiles and also they have van a venomous uh, nature. So this mixture of reptilian and mammal characteristics needed to be explored at the genetic level so that we could put them accurately within a phylogenetic tree. The giant panda is also interesting because uh, this showed us that the panda originally comes from a carnivorous ancestor. Uh, because it doesn't have the cellulase genes that you would have if you were herbivore. So this is why the poor panda has its limited diet of uh, bamboo shoots and has to rely to a certain extent on uh, gut flora and collaborations, symbiosis with uh, gut flora, which are going to allow it to process uh, a vegetarian diet when it is meant to be carnivorous. This is a bit of an evolutionary uh, dead end for the poor panda. Uh, as well as that, we also want to understand the ancestry of humans and did we come out of Africa or not? So l by looking at South African genomes, which are probably closer to the base of the human genome stem, uh, they've been able to understand that the hunter-gatherer peoples are probably the oldest known lineage of modern humans. It's also allowed us to figure out that there are two separate successive waves out of Africa. Uh, and also we now understand our relationship to Neanderthals and that there was interbreeding between Cro-Magnon and Neanderthals and that we picked up certain uh, Neanderthal features in our genomes. The next possibility is next generation sequencing to have uh, personalised genomics. Uh, that means that everybody will be able to get their own genome. The price of these has come down massively. Uh, you have 23andMe, you had Decode Genetics in Iceland and we have the thousand or the hundred thousand genomes projects which are going to show us the true diversity we get between uh, individuals. This is going to be really important because it gives us the possibilities of having personalised healthcare. There are also dangers because when you know your genome, it tells you that you have a certain probabilities 
or specific diseases, for example, cancer and heart disease. But this is not a guaranteed thing. So this means people who are tested need to have a higher level understanding and explanation of the real significance of the data that they're being given.